Okay guys, I wanted to do a uh, short conceptual video here on the topic of spontaneity. So this is the uh, beginning of the new material in the thermodynamics chapter. And what we're going to focus on here is being able to distinguish between a spontaneous thermodynamic process and a non-spontaneous thermodynamic process. And we'll discuss this in the context of the dispersal of both energy and matter. Well, on this slide, what I'm doing is I'm introducing some working definitions of a spontaneous process versus a non-spontaneous process. And where this topic comes from is the observation that all processes seem to have a natural direction of change. Okay, so this is an empirical observation. Uh, you look out into nature and you observe what's happening, and it appears that for any given process that you might consider, there's a natural direction of change and an unnatural direction of change. Uh, the definitions that we're working with here, you'll see for the spontaneous process, it's, it's a very soft definition in the sense that a spontaneous process is one that might eventually occur on its own. If given enough time, possibly it could occur, maybe it could occur, at least it's in the realm of possibility. Contrast that with the definition of a non-spontaneous process, which is very harsh. Uh, a non-spontaneous process is one that will never, ever occur on its own. And the reason for the difference between the two, the two definitions, why is the definition of a spontaneous process so wishy-washy, it's because that uh, in thermodynamics, while you can predict whether or not a process will be spontaneous, uh, that doesn't tell you anything about the rate at which the process occurs. And so I have two examples uh, from the textbook on this slide. Uh, on the left, we're considering the radioactive decay of uranium-238 and technetium-99. Both, both isotopes are radioactive, and they will spontaneously decay on their own. Uh, but as you can see in the slide, uh, they do so at very different rates. The technetium-99 uh, decays very rapidly. You see that the half-life for technetium-99 is about one day. So after one day, the amount of technetium-99 you have in your sample will have decreased by 50%. After two days, it's decreased down to about 25%, and so on. Uranium-238, on the other hand, while it is radioactive and spontaneously decays, uh, the rate at which it decays is much slower than that of technetium-99, okay? And unfortunately, uh, thermodynamics can tell us nothing about the rate at which a process occurs. For that, we need to turn back to the tools that we've already looked at for chemical kinetics. In any case, here's the second example. Uh, here we're looking at um, uh, two uh, allotropes of carbon, uh, carbon graphite, or sorry, carbon diamond over here on the left. Uh, it's a covalent network uh, structure, very strong covalent bonds. That's why diamonds are so hard. And then on the other side, we have graphite, which you'll find in your, um, in your pencils. Uh, it consists of these uh, sheets of carbon atoms that are bonded together in sort of a honeycomb lattice. And as you drag your pencil across a, a page, what happens is, is these different um, layers within the graphite, they sort of spread out uh, when you make your mark on the page. Uh, it turns out that in terms of thermodynamics, at least, uh, graphite is the more stable form of carbon. Uh, and so from this perspective, from the perspective of spontaneity, we would say that carbon spontaneously becomes graphite. However, as we know from experience, uh, diamonds do not uh, suddenly turn into to graphite as we're, as we're looking at them. Uh, diamonds, in fact, are, are very stable. Uh, and the reason they're stable is because it is such a slow process for diamond to, de to, uh, to rearrange to form graphite that it essentially never occurs. And so you can have a, a process that is thermodynamically um, uh, favored in terms of spontaneity, but kinetically uh, it just simply won't occur in any finite amount of time.
One of our objectives will be to determine whether or not a given chemical reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. Okay, and so you might, you might think in terms of the first law. You might try to think in terms of the first law and think to yourself, well, if the chemical reaction lowers its energy, then perhaps that would indicate that it would be a spontaneous process. Um, it turns out that that's not the case. Um, looking at the energy change of the chemical reaction is actually insufficient in order to determine spontaneity. Uh, we do like the first law, though, because it allows us to determine whether a process is endothermic or exothermic. We can use it as a bookkeeping tool to keep track of energy in our system, but it turns out that that's not enough to predict whether or not a process is spontaneous. So, for example, some endothermic processes are spontaneous. Uh, an example of that would be uh, the melting of ice above its melting temperature. So if you had ice at, say, 10 degrees Celsius, it will spontaneously form liquid water. However, that phase transition is an endothermic process. Okay, so it's energetically speaking uphill, but it will occur on its own under the right experimental conditions. Conversely, you can also have exothermic processes that are not spontaneous. And so the first law simply can't predict um, the first law by itself simply can't predict whether or not a given process is spontaneous. We're going to need additional criterion, and for that we're going to introduce a new state function in the next video called entropy, and along with entropy we'll, we'll come up with uh, the second and third laws of thermodynamics. In this uh, graphical example, uh, what, we'll, what we are going to note are the experimental observations that Processes that are accompanied by a dispersal of matter and or energy tend to be spontaneous. Okay, now I use the word tend very softly. That is, spontaneity is favored when matter is dispersed in the system and energy is dispersed in the system, but there's no guarantee that that's going to be a spontaneous process. So there, there's some subtleties that we'll, that we'll talk about in later videos. Uh, but for the moment, let's, let's focus on these two examples. So here we have um, a, uh, a, a, a glass vessel that contains gas on one side, and on the other side, uh, we have a vacuum. And if you open the valve uh, between, the two, uh, between the two sides of the vessel spontaneously, without having to do anything at all, the gas is going to expand to fill both sides of the vessel. And you would never ever expect uh, if, that if you were in this situation that the gas would suddenly move over to the other side on its own. In order to go from this state to that state, you would have to employ some sort of pump in order to force the gas over. You would have to do work. You would have to spend energy in order to make this non-spontaneous process occur. However, the spontaneous direction occurs on its own without any intervention uh, on, the part of, uh, on the part of the observer. Uh, the other example here involves, the, and so th this example involves the dispersal of matter. The dispersal of matter tends to be spontaneous. In this second graphical example, uh, it, it deals with the dispersal of energy. So we imagine that we have two blocks here. Uh, block X is at a higher temperature than block Y. And so the molecules within block X are moving around faster than the molecules within, within block Y. And if you bring these two blocks into thermal contact, that is if you let them touch one another, what will happen spontaneously is that energy will flow, thermal energy will flow from the hot object to the cold object, and eventually both objects will be at the same temperature. That happens spontaneously. Uh, on its own, you don't have to do anything in order, other than bring the box, the boxes into thermal contact in order for that uh, dispersal of energy to occur. And you never ever see an object that has a uniform temperature suddenly, on its own, divide into a hot side and a cold side. Right? It never goes spontaneously in the other direction. You would need to do some work in order to get this to occur. And that's exactly what happens within a refrigerator. So if you think about the outside and the inside of a refrigerator, before you plug the refrigerator in, both the outside and the inside are at the same temperature. 
But as you um, use electrical energy to, to run the refrigerator, what happens is, is that thermal energy uh, is moved from outside of the, uh, from the inside of the refrigerator to the outside, keeping the inside cold and the outside hot. So we'll stop this video here.